OK, I can uh, crack on now then. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining, for listening in. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm Alex Tilly, a, a scientist with Wellfish. Uh, some of you will know me if you're joining from Facebook, then then perhaps you don't. Um, I'm, a, I'm based in Penang in Malaysia, and I work with the Resilient Small Scale Fisheries Program. Today, I'd like to tell you a bit about my work, a bit about the work we're doing in Timor. Um, and so I'm going to give you a, an overview of kind of broad challenges related to technology in small scale fisheries. Um, and then some, some little examples from, from my work and the, the tools and techniques that we're using to try and improve uh, inclusive governance and, and well-being. So a little bit about me, my, my interests um, are, I, I come from a kind of ecology background. I'm a fisheries uh, biologist, a marine biologist, but now moving more into kind of digital tools and how to use those to improve um, small scale fisheries, livelihoods and, and the uh, gender equality and open data and collaborative kind of ecosystem based management. So really my, my focus is how to not just generate better data, but how do we actually move that towards um, better management and improved livelihoods as the as the title of the presentation uh, suggests. So I joined Wellfish back in 2016 and I started in Timor, in East Timor. Um, I'll tell you a bit about Timor in a, in a moment. Um, and we've been we've been there since sort of about 2011. Um, so this is really an overview of some of the work that we're we're doing there. So as I'm uh, casting from my my bedroom, um, it wouldn't be uh, sufficient for me not to mention COVID-19, I think, and this isn't novel by any means, but but really COVID-19 has allowed us to kind of refocus and think um, about a new normal uh, is some of the language going around. And, and it's really enlightening how digital technology has kept us connected. Um, so socially, emotionally, economically during this time. Um, also for us that work in, in science, in development, it, it forces us to, to try and think about how we use digital technology to, to target interventions because we can't be there on the ground um, with stakeholders, with communities, with fishers. So, uh, and it's important to say that also for those um, fishers and small business holders and producers, the, the digital connectivity is, is, has been vital uh, during this time and will continue to be so. But not everyone has this. I mean, not everyone has access to these tools, um, um, has, a, has a phone. Um, so that's something that um, is sort of broadly termed digital inclusion. So the amount uh, that people are connected to digital tools and uh, and services. And just some sort of overarching um, statistics. So the power structure that needs to be in place for you to be able to charge a phone, to use one, you know, or a, or a laptop or a tablet, you know, nearly a billion people in the world still are without uh, a source of power um, to their homes. The, you know, the ability to, to read and interact with things like social networking is um, completely isolated from those that cannot read, those are illiterate. And that's, you know, nearly 800 million in the world. Um, also things like women are 20% less likely to own a, a smartphone across the world on average. Um, and a billion people still don't have official government ID and all of these things. When you think about how we use digital tools without these, it makes our life impossible. Now, small scale fisheries uh, communities are often uh, a big amount of these uh, divided or not included uh, people in this digital economy. They often don't have phones and they are 
um, excluded for it. They're often unbanked, so they don't have phones and uh, sorry, don't have bank accounts. And yet, small scale fisheries are incredibly diverse. There's um, they're important or they contribute to more than a billion diets worldwide and support livelihoods for over 40 million fishers and more fish workers and account for about 50% of the, the global production from capture fisheries. And so our ability to connect these people and, and empower them through digital technology is, 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 um, is paramount and is really the focus of, of much of my work. So as I said, we, we focus uh, for this talk primarily on, on Timor-Leste or East Timor, uh, one of the newest countries in the world. It's about 20 years old. Um, it was occupied by Indonesia for around 25 years and prior to that was a Portuguese colony. And so it's, it's kind of a unique or interesting case uh, to, to trial this sort of work because that we started with basically no understanding of of fisheries. The Indonesians obviously fished a lot um, in, in the coastal waters of Timor, but we have no records of that time. So we were starting with a blank slate. And at that point, um, fisheries decision making was really completely uh, top down and actually not based on, on any kind of science or knowledge about, about the fisheries in many ways. It really just took fisheries legislation from Mozambique and from Portugal and imposed that on a system that it wasn't really fitted to. So on the screen you can see a, a very simple um, model of what is in essence top-down governance of a fishery. So you have the, the fishery, fisheries actors, the fishers and the fish workers at the, at the bottom left and the and the, the government or the decision makers in the dotted box um, who are kind of extracting information from fishers about their activities, their catch, uh, where they go and, and uh, what have you. And so then decisions are made in isolation from those who those decisions affect the most. So the, the data may be aggregated, but it's not accessible to fishers in any way. Um, so we wanted to really try and tackle uh, both of these issues in Timor. So the fact that we had no information and also the fact that often in top-down governance, the, um, that information is isolated from those that need it most or could use it to improve their livelihoods. So we, we started with... Um, uh, developing PESCAS, which is a, a fisheries monitoring system. PESCAS is a, a pseudo acronym. It's, PESCAS means fisheries in Tetun, one of the official languages of Timor. Um, and the AAS at the, at the end of it is a automated analytic system. So what that means is just that it's accumulating and aggregating data together, but it's also analyzing them and spitting out something useful at the end, which I will tell you a bit more about. And then also as part of uh, this, this, uh, this work, we wanted to move towards a national fishery strategy that, that shared the goals of, of managers of the government, but also those actors that were involved. So that, that was a process of nat nationwide consultations and so with the consultations of communities, as in them telling the government um, what they wanted from fisheries management and from fisheries and their livelihoods, we combine that with the scientific knowledge uh, from, from PESCAS, and then that informs policies. Again, this is a simplified model because obviously you would hope to have feedback mechanisms then like how is it working do we need to adapt it and then how does that feed back into the system so without going into too much detail about the the actual uh, data pipeline of of pescas um what it basically is is you've got fishers or or community members on the beach or at landing sites that are collecting information as fishers come in and land their catch um, and they ask them a couple of questions and they 
evaluate what species and, and how big the, the fish are and how many of each type and, and what have you. And then if that boat is uh, carrying a vessel tracker, uh, so we partner with Pelagic Data Systems, a US-based startup, um, which developed a solar-powered um, tracker, then the catch data is integrated with the vessel track. And so you get very high resolution effort information and you can look at where the boat went and what it caught. And so you get a catch per unit effort. Um, and then those data go into what it, you can see on here is Pesca Parser that really just manages and sorts the data and puts it in a database called Pesca Dat. Um, and then from Pesca Dat, some other code runs and analyzes those data to spit onto a dashboard uh, that is open access and and provide some simple analytics that uh, that can allow managers to make decisions based on trends and on on uh, on how the fishery is doing on stock assessment and that sort of thing now this was designed to be really simple kind of interface and it's open access you can go to that website and take a look for yourselves um, and it's very sort of it's meant to be not too many options to show the, the simple information um, because the data is still available for greater analysis for, for fisheries uh, managers. But it's a click button system and you can select the gear type you're interested in or the location and, and look at it over time or by habitat. And the, the real principle behind the development of this was to make it co-designed so that it has uh, local legitimacy, so the people that are actually using it are uh, know what it means, know how to use it, and feel that, that they actually built it because they did. Um, their information went into making it. And then the other thing was it was built using free or open source software, which means that the code is also available online, um, and people can take this and use it for their own situation, so your own country or your own fishery, your association. And this also keeps costs down because um, many of these project based systems or technologies come in and they're inputted in a community by a, an NGO or by a tech for, firm, sorry, and, um, and then there's maintenance fees and, and upkeep fees to keep the data coming in and then they might have some bugs and there's no one that can sort it out. And so really by making it open source, it can be the code can be seen by anyone and it can be maintained and the, the cost of the software is, is uh, there is none. So um, this, uh, which I hope you can see on your screen is a video that shows the resolution of the, the tracking information. So this is from the Pelagic Data Systems Solar Power Trackers. And this really gives us a very nice spatial view of what fisheries look like in Timor or wherever the, the, the boats are operational. And this really brings with it a new understanding, not only of where fishers go every day when, when you know, they disappear from shore, um, but also how long they're spending doing certain types of fishing, how they prioritize and also they have the, it has safety at sea um, benefits as well, because once we know more where fishes are, we can restrict search patterns if people are lost and uh, or other, if we know where fishes generally go fishing, we can um, reduce search patterns. So then that's all very well. Um, and we have now launched PESCAS and as of May last year, the government um, adopted it in as the national monitoring system of Timor-Leste. We have over 400 boats uh, currently generating tracking information. But still, even though the PESCAS dashboard and, and data system is there on the web, it doesn't mean that it's available to fishers. I mean, they, they could uh, they, we've given them the, the website and they can go and take a look, but it's really not empowering them. They don't hold the data and it's not really doing anything for them at this stage. So there's another missing link, um, which we are in the process of researching and developing, is really how to uh, empower fishers by having them hold 
the data. So this data ownership is a big issue in any uh, walks of life and, and also in as part of the blue economy. So our goal is really to try and empower fishers and give them a voice in the blue economy, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So in the final sort of slides of this presentation, I'd like to focus on this hypothetical platform or app um, that you can see in the in the red, like the red little sketch and how this might benefit uh, well-being. So at, at the fisher or fish worker level, um, if you imagine them inputting it, not necessarily them having their own smartphone because there are there are barriers, cost barriers to that, but this might happen at a household level or a fisher association or even a community level if they if they contribute to an app themselves. Um, and, and so there are certain uh, benefits to it, and we want to try and encourage uh, encourage this. One is the ability to to have personalised insights. So if if a, an association or a fisher are going out and they're spending a certain amount on fuel and bait and and gear repairs or new gear investments, and they want to see how is their profit margin you know based on what they're catching versus what they're spending you know simple analytics in a in a, a personalized platform can do that very easily you can also show them maps of where they go what their catch efficiency is uh, based on location or based on gear type uh, they might just be really interested to see uh, what time of year they they caught more of a certain type of fish it also allows them to to highlight in data when they are catching certain amounts of fish and to plan their their business or their you know their um, access certain markets according to that so that's that's one and there's lots related to kind of digital marketplace opportunities so if a date if a fisher or an association has data on their production and over time and the different species and then they can actually um, advertise that on a platform, then that allows them to shorten market chains um, and and actually connect with consumers and uh, restaurants perhaps or or higher level buyers directly, and thereby increasing the potential um, price they can get for certain catch. There is a cautionary note here, and a lot of uh, the early work around this even as long ago as sort of Jensen in 2007 said that uh, this actually might allow fishers arbitrage in, in terms of, well, if the market price is better one place, then they could go there instead of selling to their usual ones. But this is very context specific and actually um, is likely not to work in most cases because often fishers owe money to certain people who have, or that certain people will take a, a a chunk of the catch or the, the profits and so it's really dependent on the situation so we have to be a little bit careful there. I alluded to this earlier um, but another key process in, in fishers controlling the the flow of data is um, is that they hold the the data empowers them, it gives them a voice by, by building up an evidence of their livelihoods. One example to illustrate this is, is in Taiwan a, a few years ago, there was a, um, an event where a, a container ship crashed into the northern part of the island and spilled oil um, over a, a large fishing ground of a local, um, a few local communities. But as it happened, the, the Ocean University of Taiwan was actually conducting trials of GPS tracking technology that they developed themselves, and they, they integrated this with catch information from local auction houses and markets. And so thankfully could very accurately estimate the, the value of the loss um, of them not being able to fish in that area or not being able to fish at all and, and how uh, and what price to kind of put on the reparations to come from from that company and that really empowered their voice in that negotiation another example is land reclamation um, obviously when you reclaim land and build islands you are destroying fishing uh, habitat you're making that area not available to the fishers that might have used it and so again you have the situation whereby you can actually evaluate the 
the different actors in in the blue economy or the different stakeholders and and what is one losing out to a certain development um, to another and how governments can really weigh or tra weigh those trade-offs uh, between different um, different actors and another thing which isn't immediately obvious but is by as I mentioned by building up in information about uh, where fishers go and what their patterns are throughout the year it actually informs safety at sea and, and governments uh, can build up information about how to help um, fishers and, and fishers families by maybe keeping in touch or providing mechanisms whereby they can communicate in an emergency or who they should uh, call and also it reduces the, the search patterns if they are lost at sea. Lastly, in, in this um, aspect, uh, there's obviously a huge amount, I mean, on our own phones and tablets and, and computers, we know how much we now access, you know, mobile banking and access to, you know, uh, stocks and shares perhaps, or we look at YouTube to, to know how to repair my, my kid's toy that he broke, or, or it might be repair my computer or, or what have you. Um, but th that is not accessible to a great many, nearly a billion people in the world that don't have access to the, these technologies. And so there's flowing to the, the actors who can use a platform like this, there's an enormous capacity building and awareness raising um, possibilities. Also directly from government, government can share information about new loan programs or, or opportunities in the sector or new techniques, technologies in fisheries that they may not be aware of. Um, likewise, also in terms of building up a record of their livelihood, it allows them in essence to, to have a payment history for, for credit. Because if they don't have a bank account, then they may be able to use this record of catches over time as a, as a kind of um, transparent um, evidence of their ability to repay a loan and that's becoming uh, microcredit and, and risk um, mitigation and, and insurance and things in fisheries is a very under-researched area um, and, and will be increasing and increasingly growing over the next couple of years. So this will become ever more important in how do fishers actually show their, their ability to, to uh, pay microcredit. Um, and lastly, in terms of transparency, so relating back to market chains, as I mentioned before, their ability to show who they are, where fish were caught, how long they were out, like what gear they used, incre increases their opportunities in a market sense uh, to sell directly to consumers and to, to restaurants because of the traceability um, element. Um, so they can actually uh, trace the the source of the fish from the person that caught it all the way through to to who inevitably eats it or buys it so then um as i mentioned the the this covid 19 we're all stuck at home i hope um uh but it it's an opportunity to to refocus and especially drive for greater awareness and greater access for for isolated and impoverished um, communities, uh, especially in sectors such as small-scale fisheries, where they need access to these tools. But also from the developing side, uh, developer side, we need ethical, transparent, value-adding tools at the base level, um, because fishers are not going to contribute data to just for the promise of co-management, just for the promise of being able to be included in decision making. They need to be value adding for their livelihoods, for their well-being, um, be it economic well-being or even just social cohesion, um, and and so that will it, it's a win-win. So if governments can actually encourage or engage fishers in this, it will it will lead to inclusive growth of the sector, um, increased GDP. Um, but there is this inherent fear like a data security fear amongst governments at the moment especially when it comes to tracking and this is sort of from our own experience is very much true is that the governments are like oh well we don't we're not comfortable about letting people access where our fishers are going and it's really based on because they 
cannot control where individual boats go and, and they're like, likely to suffer sort of uh, ramifications from other countries pointing the finger. But if we do some kind of scenario analysis and imagine if, it, if there's greater transparency across the board, then we're kind of all in the same boat, we're all sharing information and there's, there's quite good um, global um, ideas and, and initiatives around this at the moment. So governments really need to find out more about what the real, what is the basis of those fears and actually how to, how to encourage um, better transparency from the ground up right through to a national level. So that's it from me. I wanted to say thank you very much for, for taking the time to listen um, and, and not that you've got anywhere else to go. Uh, I hope the technology worked because it was likely that uh, in a technology focused talk that something was going to go pear shaped um, with the, the technology. So I will um, pass over, I think, to Doina who may have some questions for me. For those that are joining on Facebook, I am going to stop that current cast and start a new one. I think I've been told to, um, because then you can see my face and, in, and I can interact with you through that. So I'm going to try and uh, stop that sharing now. Doina, over to you. Thank you, Alex. This was great. And I have a few questions coming in. I will wait for a few more questions in the chat here on MS Teams. But as we wait, can you please tell us the next steps in more detail, like what are the scaling countries maybe? Sure. Uh, let me just bear with me for one second while I try and, uh, and get out of this to and reconnect with. So I'm going to end the. Uh, do I know will that work if I end the live video and then start it again or shall I just. Yeah, yeah, you yep. can just um, you can just uh, continue with the same video. It's fine because you have already a few followers there. Oh, OK, so I'll just keep yeah. that one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so don't I'm worry about the... the first questions for you. The first few questions for you in the group chat here on Teams, but please, uh, everyone with questions, please come forward. This is the Q and A session, so we need to like um, get more out of Alex. Basically, we need more information out of out of him on this uh, digital tools and what he's doing and how this is going to be uh, scaled up. Yeah, uh, by all means, also on, on Facebook, if you have questions, I'll try and have a look at those if you put them in the chat there. Um, so good question about the, the scaling. So um, I was lucky enough to, to be a winner of the, um, the Inspire Challenge uh, in 2018 and, and the Inspire Challenge Scale Up uh, Runner Up Prize last year, which is uh, put on by the Big Data and Agriculture platform. Um, and uh, my children are shouting at the door, so <laughs> you have to excuse the noise. Um, and and so as part of that is scaling geographically, but also uh, working on the technical side. So on the development of the, the tools itself, as I mentioned, so uh, thinking about how to create something functional and usable at a Fisher level. It's been tried and tested on very local scale in different countries. There's a very nice um, suite of apps. Uh, from South Africa called Abalobi, which uh, some people maybe have heard of. And there are other sort of smaller um, ideas developing. And I'd really like to keep um, building the kind of uh, group understanding and sharing of lessons in that sense. So how to really create something that is usable. usable. And so one of the steps will be to, to meet with stakeholders in different regions of the world to get their their insight into what would be relevant in their context um, and in their kind of fisheries. Um, obviously, during COVID-19, travel is is an issue uh, for good reason. Um, so at the moment, we're really focusing on how to make this sustainable from both a business sense. Um, so I'm working with some other innovators here at World Fish and, and some business-minded folks. Um, and also, as I mentioned, about the actual technical tools. So we're we're ramping up our data science team at WorldFish. 
um, hiring new members and really trying to uh, trying to focus on on knuckling down on the on the coding and developing aspects. So I'm going to read a few more questions for you, Alex. Uh, one is coming from Cristiano. He's curious about the economic sustainability of the innovation, especially in consideration that this will be taken over by partners and public sectors. Yeah, a good question. And, and as I mentioned in the talk, like this is this was very much a part of the development. We were thinking about this ahead of time and and really trying to make it as open source as possible and as cheap as possible. Um, so are the, the software environment, um, the kind of statistical computing environment that it was developed in is open source, as is Shiny, which is the dashboard itself. Um, but but of course, I mean, there are, as you scale and, and you lose the, the connection to, as it's taken on by others, um, we have to still maintain, and I think Worldfish is in a good position to maintain relationships with um, with those, those users to try and support them in, in a way. And we have the capability of doing that. Um, really, the... Um, Oh, I see my the live cast has um, ended. Uh, maybe someone did that. But yeah, so in there is sort of financial sustainability. So for for Wellfish, as I mentioned, it's the the key is to um, charge for a, a tiered like higher analytical system, and then that will help to pay for the open access system available to fishers and other stakeholders. Um, in, in that sense. Sorry, I was a bit distracted there, but I hope that answers the question. Cristiano, we can we can chat about this at another time. Uh, we... we have another question coming from Dave. We are seeing in a number of countries concerns being raised about governments accessing personal data for a policy response to COVID. Are there downsides and risks for indivi individual fishers in providing data? Um, that's certainly a very, very good question. And at the moment, I think there's many, um, many examples where there are uh, bad uses of personal data and actually non-ethical ones. And um, the idea behind the, the new developments of this system is really to put the fisher in charge of the data primarily and from there then data they choose the data that uh, they are submitting or contributing to a larger aggregated system. Um, obviously the, the ethical and anonymous um, uh, aspects or characteristics of that kind of broader system are fundamental and they really need to um, they really need to focus on making sure there is nothing that can identify individuals in there. Uh, in terms of the specific ones around COVID-19, I mean that certainly around uh, uh, trace uh, tracing cases and things. I think there are some dubious examples, um, but in in fisheries, we just need to focus on making sure that uh, we we have thought of that ahead of time, and there's security is, you know aspects in place to deal with it. I'm going to try and uh, post, go live on Facebook again. Um, let me see if I can do this. All right, I am now again live on Facebook, I think. We have another question coming in from Mike. Are you seeing any responses in the tracked fisheries under COVID-19? Uh, uh, great, thanks, Mike. Um, yes, the uh, we actually did initially see a sort of dip uh, when in the amount of trips that were taking place. So the the we can track in Timor, we're tracking around 400 vessels. So that gives us pretty much a national coverage of um, uh, of boats in in. I mean, it's a good percentage of about 20% of the boats in the country. Um, and and so you can actually see the the dip in effort or the number of trips as the the lockdown initiated. 
Um, but actually the government has allowed fishers to continue to operate. And so it's sort of, uh, in simple terms, yes, we can we can sort of see the, uh, the dynamic of that. And unfortunately, I mean, Timor is the only place we have such a number of boats. We do have, uh, we're tracking a few different vessels across about seven other countries, but it's only a, a handful, uh, one or two. So, um, so it would, for future reference, I mean, these systems provide the ability to be able to track um, elements of food systems and where there might be bottlenecks or where, you know, the fishers may continue to to keep fishing, but they can't sell it to anyone. And so we're also seeing cases of, of uh, discarded catches and, and things, which is a, a real tragedy. And we have another question. Uh, can we use this system to trace fish species in the rice field fishery system or CFR? Uh, can we use it to, to track what, sorry? I didn't catch fish that. species in the rice field fishery system. Uh, can we track fish species in the rice field fish uh, fisheries uh, of uh, the Mekong and other places, I presume? I'm just going to repeat the question for, uh, um, for Facebook Live in case they can't hear it. Um, uh, theoretically, yes, um, because if you are if you have standardised sort of catch reporting by certain um, <clears throat> certain uh, fishers, and they can see they can report by species what they are catching, then you would actually get a spatial um, dynamic of seeing over over space and time how those different species were represented in catches. So that would um, involve some some good GIS skills, but being able to, to view that in a um, in a geographical sort of information system would be would be fascinating. So yes, theoretically that's that's possible. Obviously in in foot fisheries where people are walking across different um, habitats, so rice fields and ditches and and uh, small lakes and flooded areas that aren't there all the year round, you you would need to, you wouldn't be able to do tracking in the traditional sense, but you could potentially do energetic tracking using like smartwatch uh, um, energetics uh, or expenditure of energy and things. Uh, there, there is lots of fun stuff that could be done, I'm sure. We have another question. Is there any possibility to include climate information service in the in this digital platform from which the fishers can be benefited, like when to go for fishing or when to return, or which area is suitable for fishing, considering the weather conditions and forecasts? Yeah, really good question. And, and definitely something that we have considered um, integrating as part of the, the scale up and the, the improvement of the system is looking at historical weather data and looking at how that affected different fishing patterns and, and activities and the catch itself um, in, in different areas. Um, and But I think in terms of showing that as, as part of the, the fisher level on the ground app, absolutely that's the, the ultimate aim. Uh, but I think there's some sort of higher level big data analytics that need to go into modeling, you know, climate variation with catch data over a, a longer period of time. And this is this is really one of the, the value adds for how um, how contributing to larger aggregated uh, data systems can can give back to the fishers because then those analytics can can translate into meaningful changes to livelihoods and safety. Um, so in the in the next steps, I can't imagine that it's something we can easily develop and integrate into a, a Fisher app or a Fisher platform. Um, but it's certainly an inevitable goal to to start doing those analytics at an aggregated level for sure. We have another question. Is the system able to detect breeding grounds? Uh, that's a more complicated one. Uh, I probably from a fisheries ecologist out there. My, I'm tempted to say say no. Um, at least at this stage, 
The, we use some big data sort of machine learning analytics, so some some um, algorithms to detect different types of phishing. So it's quite easy to to see the difference between steaming when someone is going uh, straight and fast to a phishing ground, and then when they're phishing, for example, with a gillnet, it's more of a looping um, pattern. Uh, but but actually, at the moment, knowing when certain fish were caught um, and others on the same fishing trip is not e not easy or possible to discern. However, if that that catch was full of sort of gravid females, for example, or or um, you know uh, species that exhibit other traits when they are spawning. Um, like coloration, body coloration, and that and that catches from there. And then you could look at, you could overlay, do some more machine learning around um, how do you, where did those fishes go, and and did it coincide with others that were going to the same place who also caught uh, spawning species? Then yeah. So actually, I changed my mind. I think I think it probably could be used for that, but we haven't uh, yet. What have we got? Anyone Anyone else uh, has a burning question for me? <laughs> Let's uh, give the audience a few more minutes. All right. <clears throat> Alex, Mike here. I really Hi, enjoyed Mike. that. Well done. Well, what can uh, we do to get more of these trackers on boats around our focal and scaling countries. I mean, it's yielding so much useful data, very strong direction for better management. We should have them widely deployed across the organization. What can we do to support that? Yeah, thanks, Mike. I, I agree. Um, the the issue is, is really one that I, I sort of alluded to in the presentation around uh, data security fears often by governments. Um, so one one plan of mine over the coming months is to really dive deeper into what are the what's the basis of those fears and how can we alleviate those in developing new projects and and um, installing more trackers on boats. Uh, but one thing I've found is is really to identify champions or local champions in fisheries, um, be it at a, a very base sort of community level or, or in government itself, and, and sort of get them to drive the agenda within their uh, community or, or institution. And, that, and that's worked relatively well. I mean, that's to some extent how it worked well in Timor, because um, it's not always the highest person, you know, you have to get the DG on board or else it won't work. It, it's really you need to find people that are passionate and see the value of something and then they'll they'll take it forward and, and fight your your corner um, also so I think world fish is in a in a really good um, position given how embedded we are with government institutions around our, our countries um, so I think just frequent and and more information being given to in-country actors and that's probably a uh, and my responsibility to sort of provide more information and, and to allay those fears about data security. Um, so, yeah, I'm interested in, if anyone is, is interested in trialing it, um, it, Pelagic Data Systems are a great partner and always willing to throw a few systems uh, out there for free just to see how it works in, in different uh, country contexts. Um, so anyone out there that, that wants to give it a try and um, or even fishers and um, that are that are listening in. If you if you want to try one on your on your boat, then let us know. <laughs> Alex, thanks. Let's hear from everyone in the country. Yeah, get in touch with Alex. Let's get these these trackers out there. Um, I have another question, Alex, coming in. How can other fisheries value chain actors benefit from this platform? Well, there are enormous number of uses in terms of digital marketplaces and really our ability to connect those together. I mean, that's what's lacking right now is, is how 
small scale fishers can can access new market opportunities. So through one really nice thing that that has uh, um, come about because of COVID-19 and just locally here in Malaysia is is that uh, quite large companies have, have invested time and, and effort into creating quite rapid technological tools to connect small uh, producers to, to new markets. And so this is where it's really fascinating to see the effect of this kind of lockdown um, because they can't often access their traditional market connections. So being able to produce quick and uh, quick and dirty tools to allow fishers to connect with with others, uh, other sellers is, is a real uh, opportunity that's that's not really being used to the full in, in small scale fisheries. It would be a really nice um, uh, impetus, I suppose, or stimulus for, for this inclusive growth of, of fisheries. The issue is there are broader, broader challenges, as I mentioned, like the, in terms of the digital divide. Often these communities are, are only uh, informal economies. They're not actually, you know, they're not part of any established uh, banking network and things like that. So actually connecting them to people you need, there's a lot of awareness raising and capacity building that needs to happen first. Alex? Alex um, I have Hi. another question coming in from Facebook. Can the data be used for regional studies and especially to identify illegal fishing in international waters? Uh, for regional studies, certainly. I mean, that's that's my pipe dream, is that enough uh, enough countries and fisheries come on board and agree to to have their data open access, that, that we really build up this kind of global or regional platforms where we can use the data together to look at ecosystem-based um, governance of, of fisheries and, and uh, uh, aquatic food systems and so certainly I mean that's that's the uh, the inevitable goal or one of them. Um, what was the second part of the question? Sorry Donna? Um, to identify illegal fishing in internet oh, yeah. waters. Um, certainly if you're tracking vessels and the vessels that you are tracking um, go where they shouldn't then then you would see it um, and that that has happened uh, in in various places. Uh, that we've we, that we've seen, but it, there's there's got to be a kind of give and take involved, and these are small scale fisheries based on very small producers and often subsistence level fishers. Um, so really, in starting up this project, it wasn't about enforcement and compliance. It wasn't about IUU because a lot of that narrative is not relevant for situations of um, of food security and nutrition security, as in small scale fisheries. But but certainly. Even though um, you cannot and probably wouldn't want to tag every or install a tracker on every single boat in a certain place, you can actually use a combination of technologies. So, for example, if you did have all of your um, your community boats tracked uh, with a vessel tracker, and then you had kind of a surface radar, and you and you saw other boats there that weren't appearing on your your tracking system, then then you would identify those as, as boats that weren't meant to be there. So yes, that, that actually has the, the potential in combination with other technologies that can certainly be, be used for, for that purpose. But as I say, in the small scale fisheries, this wasn't the, the primary goal. It wasn't to sort of catch people out. And that's, that's a big part of why we were able to get so many uh, fishers on, in Timor and other places on board initially was they were very happy to, to kind of give back and learn more about their fishery because not a lot was known. It wasn't it wasn't about um, put this on your boat so we can see, you know, see what you're up to and monitor your activities. We have another remark, comment coming from Paula. FAO launched a project on global atlas on AIS based fishing activity. The work mainly has been done for large vessels at the moment, but they will they look for more data integration on small scale fisheries. Maybe unite forces with FAO on this would give more visibility to, 
to you and country level and government level, is this something you would consider to follow up? Thanks, Paula. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am actually already uh, in conversations with FAO and um, a lot of the work that I do is actually in partnership with them in any case. Um, <clears throat> But absolutely, the, the systems, you know, Global Fishing Watch and and uh, and the initiatives around making, you know, the AIS and VMS data uh, open access is is a real um, a real need, um, and it fits well with what we're doing. But the, you know, the the small scale fisheries is a huge data gap in the world, and so we are talking with FAO about how we can contribute to, to filling that gap and, and working better together to kind of uh, create an integrated system. Um, there's no uh, definite or designated project right now, but we're, we're kind of in communication um, for sure. One, one idea as part of the, to enable the scaling of this and, and reflects on Mike's question earlier, how do we scale this, you know, how do we get governments to uh, to, to tag more vessels with this approach and um, spread the, the system and, and one might be a, a, a partnership specifically with FAO whereby they endorse the the app or the system and, and they were um, offering it as a, as a potential tool to governments that they're uh, advising or in uh, um, in communication with. So, yeah, it, there's lots of opportunities, but nothing concrete as yet. Alex, may I directly ask you and also inform our colleagues on uh, important um, information that Alex kindly piloted two uh, trackers in two of our Bangladeshi artisanal boards, and I hope they are producing the good results. And I have informed it to government, and we are waiting uh, for Alex and Pip's visit to present his wonderful technology to the uh, Department of Fisheries, who are now implementing a large $242 million project. So uh, if the COVID doesn't allow you to visit uh, in a short while, then possibly another option that you may directly write to uh, the DZ and uh, project director, I'll give their address, that this is the technology available and we have requested to come to Bangladesh in April and present it to you for your understanding and uh, evaluate its value. However, since we cannot move now, this is the situation, how could we proceed together? So that would be useful and it's a unique opportunity to apply your technology in the Bengal fisheries. It has got, Bangladesh has got 255 large vessel so we can sustain 20 large vessels, and we have got about 70,000 uh, artisanal fisheries bowl. So Bangladesh do not have a good uh, fisheries biologist, but there are ecologists who can uh, collaborate with you as well. So look forward to uh, seeing you and look forward to your next course of action. Thank you, Alex. Great, thank you, Wahabia. Yeah, that all sounds great, and I, I can't wait to get there uh, once once traveling is allowed. Um, but yeah, also virtually, I'm happy to uh, to present if that works or, or we could uh, we could definitely write to them. But it's wonderful and I, I think it's a real opportunity to be so embedded with, with government and have their ears, so to speak. Thank you, thank you. Uh, were there any more questions on Facebook? I'm not sure. There was something about catfish breeding, which I'll pass over to uh, to Matt or to uh, to Mike. <laughs> I think we can end. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, I couldn't see that. I'm on my phone. I couldn't catch no that problem. one. No. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, I, I I'm either back of, to you or if Matthew is out there, I'm sure there are plenty of people <laughs> who know sort of about anyway. catfish there. <laughs> All right, shall we uh, call it a day there, now. Duana? Yeah, I think um, if we don't have any more questions, I think uh, we can call it a day. Thank you so much for this presentation and for 
lovely discussion that we had here, all of you. Thank you for bringing forward your questions. Great participation. Um, Alex, do you want to say something? No, I just uh, thanks very much for listening. It's great to, to, to arrange this. I, I think I was more nervous doing this with all this technology than I would be if I was in front of you all. Um, which is, yeah, but it's, uh, I, I want to tell everyone to stay safe and all oh, the gangs arrived so everyone can say hello. Yeah. <laughs> um, bye bye. So say bye. bye. Say, say, say. Bye bye. Say, Alex, say, they are the upcoming presenter for us. Great, great job, Alex. The upcoming really, presenters. Really fantastic. We like to congratulate them. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Fantastic job. Great. Bye.